I'd like to tell you a little bit about my grandmother. Gogo Martina Chelagat Tum is my grandmother, and the word Gogo is an affectionate way of saying grandmother in my native language. My grandmother lived in a time where there wasn't much. Her house was lined with clay that she would find in rivers to insulate it, and the light that she used in her house was basically candles and kerosene, and this is the type of energy that she used in her house for most of her life. She lived in a world that she didn't have much, but then this did not bother her. This is my grandmother with my niece. Notice what she's holding, and that's a piece of twine that she would rub together to create a kind of thread, and then she would use that thread to weave beads into necklaces, into jewelry, into functional objects like this gourd. So if you notice, this is the work of her hands with the beads and the different colors. And this, she made the marks with um, a piece of metal that she, she would put in hot coal to create just these simple fractal-like designs. She lived in a time where, for something to exist, you actually had to make it with your own hands. And she also lived in a time where you had to fix things with whatever was on hand. She was always reusing containers, recycling, and I would see these small things in her kitchen and in her house where she would just reuse things. There was no waste in her house. And in her, when she passed away and I was thinking about her, and I realized that she was not just my grandmother, she was also a maker. And the idea of the maker movement is as intertwined in African culture, as, and it's as old as time itself. So, when I thought about this, how do we tap into the African maker spirit? And if we're daring enough, can we tap into this so that we can create not just for Africa, but, but for the rest of the world? With the spirit of Gogo and some of these thoughts around making, I look into the work that I'm doing right now with Ushahidi and the team that we work together globally. So Ushahidi is a global organization that started in Kenya. And for me, when we started around collaborating, creating software for crowdsourcing information, but then it's grown, it's been five years now, and it's starting to exemplify and to create that bridge between the idea of Africa and the idea of uh, the technology world. It's a connection, and it actually showed that things can come out of Africa and spread towards to the rest of the world. So, Things can scale. We've been able to leverage this idea of open source, community, and innovation, and to have the platform being used around the world in over 30 countries, in over 150 countries, and in, um, it's been translated into more than 30 languages. And it also became a catalyst for other in initiatives, including the iHub, which is a space where technologists can grow businesses, they can connect with each other, they can have access to knowledge, to uh, connections to investors, and also to mentors. And this includes women, by the way. There have been more than 11,000 members. And this is, they are part and parcel of the emerging story of Africa. And this idea spread not just from, Nairo it spread from Nairobi to places like Lusaka, Zambia, to Nigeria, to Cameroon, to Ghana. So there's this upswell of talent in the software space. And this story of making things, particularly in the software space with mobile applications, is growing and there's talent there. There's more that we can tap into in this space. One of the things that we realized that even though we had some success in spurring 
the startup culture in the software space and mobile application space. Uh, with an example of Kenya, where we had startup, we had 15 startups in 2010, and now more than 48 startups after 2012, is that there was something missing. What was missing is the, I, the space, a space like the iHub, but for makers that taps into the maker spirit to make actual physical objects. So there's a lot that we're doing in the, the software space, that, but we were not seeing startups in the hardware space. So we created this idea of Gearbox, and we did not wait for resources. We did not wait for grants. We've already started to uh, bring together artists, engineers like Juliette Wanyeri, to co collaborate and to start making things. We're also putting together kids' maker camps and hacker camps to teach them how to program using Scratch, a programming language out of MIT Media Lab, how to program uh, Raspberry Pis and Arduino. And let me tell you something, when it comes to making things in Africa, particularly in East Africa, it's not easy. And we realized this when we started to create a product called The Brick. And The Brick is a redesign of the modem that takes into account the current reality in East Africa, where we have frequent power blackouts. It's very annoying. Unreliable connectivity and challenging environments. So we looked at the modem, which is a very important device for us who are very dependent on the internet, and said, how can we redesign this so that it can work better for our environment? And so we came up with the brick, and the brick is, for me, it's a cool device because it can do two things. It can connect people, it can create a Wi-Fi hotspot for up to 20 people, and you can create also an ad hoc network. So you can see how this can be used in a rural setting for a school where content can be shared. But the cooler part of the brick is the fact that it has GPIO pins, which can be used to connect sensors. And this idea that you can, the brick can be an on-ramp for the Internet of Things. So you can instrument things, you can program and send commands through the brick to turn on a light, to connect a weather station, and do other countless things that we haven't thought about yet. It is simply a backup generator for the Internet. And one of the things that we realized with this is that entrepreneurs and makers need opportunity, they need a community, they need investment, most of all, they need most of all, they need a space where they can collaborate with each other to make more things. So when we think about why should we invest in the idea of a maker industry, turns out there's a correlation between investing in this industry and an increase in GDP. And the same thing is also apparent when you invest in connectivity. So it's worth doing this to create a space for making of physical objects and to try and scale that. Because, like I said before, with all these centers, uh, places like the IHUB in Africa, the talent is there, but the opportunity is not. And those centers are providing a place where entrepreneurs have a chance. But right now, what we're seeing is there isn't much of a chance for innovators and inventors to make things like the brick. And we need to create this and to, to, to make the space for this. The other thing about this is that once we can create the space in Africa, that these ideas can also scale. I look back to the work that we've done with Ushahidi and realize that innovation can scale. We still joke about the fact that if it works in Africa, it can work anywhere. And we see this with the Ushahidi platform, which was one of the first products that the Ushahidi team put together. And it's been used to map crises from Haiti to Japan, to map protests in Ukraine, to map elections in Kenya, and even human rights in Syria. So these things can scale. The question is, how do we support entrepreneurs to help them get to the next level? How do we get them there? We can start by investing and creating the space for them to play. 
to realize and to tap into the maker spirit. Because if we do this, we can tap into that inventiveness, the making, the fixing. And if we do this, Africa can truly emerge as an innovation engine for the world. Thank you.